Well, I think they were able to move forward some of the prior agreements made under uh, President Obama's administration, uh, notably uh, allowing U.S. beef into China and uh, allowing uh, processed Chinese poultry into the United States. Even though, that, even though those had been announced uh, several years ago or as recently as a year ago, um, there were many working details that had to be uh, completed. And I think that uh, under the 100-day uh, plan put together by President uh, Xi and President Trump, they were able to actually accomplish uh, those implementation steps so that there are really no impediments now uh, to uh, trade on those two commodities between our two countries. I think they're still working out on many other details, and uh, hopefully with the upcoming uh, uh, dialogue this week in Washington, D.C., they'll be able to make further progress. If we look at Chinese foreign policy towards the United States, much of the focus has been on trade and economic ties. What is the significance of that? Well, we are the two world's largest economies, and millions of jobs, both in China and the United States, depend on trade with each other. Um, China is America's number one export destination outside of uh, North America, outside of Canada and Mexico. Uh, and for America, we are uh, China's number one export destination, with exports from China to the United States exceeding the exports to all of the EU countries combined. Uh, for our farm products, uh, such as beef and everything else, and wheat and soybeans, China is our number one agricultural destination, export destination, period. So again, millions and millions of good paying jobs on both sides of the Pacific depend on this deepening economic integration. There's such a high demand for American-made goods and services, whether it's helping to clean up the environment of China, to medical devices, uh, to food, uh, to technology, uh, to fashion. And uh, with the growing middle class of China, that means a huge market for made-in-USA goods and services, which means more jobs for the American people. Now, one of the big U.S. complaints in this trade relationship is the deficit. It is an issue which has been recognized by China. It is being addressed. Let's take a listen to what the Chinese Vice Premier Wang Yang had to say on the issue. Unfortunately, American businesses have not had their fair share of the cake due to outdated U.S. regulations on export control. In 2001, U.S. high-tech exports to China accounted for 16.7 percent of China's total import of such products, while last year their percentage dropped to 8.2 percent. According to an op-ed by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace last April, if the United States were to liberalize its export barriers against China to the same level as those applicable to Brazil or France, the U.S. trade deficit with China would narrow by up to 24 percent and 34 percent, respectively. So, Ambassador, listening to those figures there, is it time for the United States to change or reform its export policy towards China, high technology exports? Well, when I was Secretary of Commerce working with Secretary of Defense Bob Gates and, and the State Department, we were able to streamline uh, the controls, the regulations over high tech exports uh, to many, many countries, including China. Uh, so, we did liberalize things, we did make things easier. Uh, companies in America that still want to uh, import certain technology goods to China uh, still have to apply for a license, still have to file, uh, and have to make sure that those products do not end up uh, ultimately for military purposes. Uh, but um, there are many, many other products that still are restricted. And I doubt that uh, the uh, United States will change that policy for quite some time. And these are restrictions not just for China, but many other countries as well. And primarily around, uh, surrounding high-tech goods that can easily be used for military uh, purposes. And that right now is uh, a, a U.S. impediment, U.S. prohibition, uh, and something that cannot be easily changed and will not be changed in these talks. You mentioned those agreements where uh, the Chinese market is open to U.S. beef and U.S. markets are open to Chinese processed poultry. Uh, given that those agreements were made, where do you see the potential for other major agreements? Well, obviously, um, uh, there are many other sectors of the Chinese economy that are completely closed off to uh, foreign investment, uh, whether it's in the financial services sector, whether it's in uh, uh, natural resources, aviation, and things like that. Uh, again, there are great opportunities for American companies to help meet the needs and the demands of both Chinese companies and the Chinese consumer in these areas. 
Uh, there are many uh, areas, for instance, in financial services sector where Chinese companies don't even offer products. Uh, it's a sweet spot of American companies. So allowing access uh, by American companies into some of these sectors would not necessarily create competition with the Chinese companies, but really offer the consumer and other businesses, uh, industrial users, a lot more choice. Those are the type of win-win situations that we should really be pursuing. I want to look at one other commodity now that's been getting a lot of attention, and that is liquefied natural gas, uh, particularly gas from Alaska. President Xi visited Alaska after his meeting with President Trump. How can these LNG exports uh, to China boost the U.S. energy market and at the same time be of benefit to China? Well, obviously, it creates jobs uh, for the American people, uh, whether it's uh, the ports of Alaska, to the people who are working in the uh, oil fields, the natural gas fields, uh, to the ports uh, that would export the liquefied natural gas in the lower 48 states. Uh, but this would also help meet the energy needs of China in a way that uh, can help China reduce its dependence on coal for energy. Because we know just how uh, um, devastating uh, the use of coal is in terms of air pollution, but also in terms of the emission of greenhouse gases. Now, yes, liquid natural gas is still a fossil fuel, but it is still so much cleaner uh, than coal. President Trump has focused very much on an America first policy. We've heard that in many of his speeches, whereas President Xi Jinping of China has extolled the virtues of globalization. How can these two countries uh, work together with differing visions like this? Well, I, I, uh, one really needs to ask President Trump what he really means by that America first policy um, because uh, um, there are so many things that he wants made in the United States, uh, foreign companies to establish their facilities here in the United States, to make sure that U.S. companies do all their manufacturing in the United States. Uh, but if he's going to demand that foreign companies have to set up their factories here in the United States, whether, whether it's Toyota or BMW and, and Audi and things like that, which they already do. Well, then that means that other countries can also demand that U.S. companies set up their facilities and their manufacturing facilities in, their, in those other countries as well. I mean, um, if, if we insist that other countries must accept U.S. goods and services that are made in America, those other countries can turn right around and say that America has to accept their goods and services made in those other countries and allow those to be shipped into uh, the United States. So you just can't have it uh, one way. It's got to be equal. It's got to be a, a level playing field. There has to be reciprocity. Um, if we demand that uh, uh, other countries buy our products, we've got to be willing to buy products from those countries as well.